<clears throat> All righty. Uh, um, yeah. So we had at least 19 guys um, RSVP. Oh, wow. Sometimes okay. more show up. Um, so we'll see what happens and um, we'll go from there. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is the worst part, eh? The waiting. Yeah, I. It's always like um, I get nervous right before I do a talk or anything like that, right? Um, generally, I'm I'm very introverted, so I don't like speaking in front of a crowd, but I force myself to do it anyways. So, uh, <laughs> so it's always like right before I start, nervous, nervous, and then I I just kind of get into it and I'm good. But um, yeah. Yeah, should be uh should be good. I got some talking points to go with the um with the PowerPoint because I don't like just read the PowerPoint. You know, that's just kind of mostly my talking points, and then I I speak to them and uh, give examples and that sort of stuff. Um, I'm just kind of go from there. Um, cool, cool. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you um do you work with companies that send people to you know not denied um, areas, but, you know, semi-permissive and stuff like that? Um, no, I don't, but it's something that I'd like to kind of start to get into. Um, I'm days away from getting my actual official release from the forces. And, um, uh, I'd, I'd like to start building true North Tradecraft into more of a consultancy for stuff like that. Uh, delivering training to either governments or corporations and stuff like that. Um, like I, specialize in uh, the counter custody stuff a lot um and you know nobody really in canada is doing it so it's uh, something i'd like to to build upon do you know uh, karina huggins have you met her in our group yet i i actually have uh i had a i mean not um not in person but just uh, on instagram a little bit uh so uh, we chatted a little and um yeah, that's <laughs> looking forward to getting to know her better and you guys as well. Cool beans. Cool beans. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to start letting folks in. All right. Let's, let's give her. All... Hey, uh, guys and gals, I'm going to keep letting people in. Holly, nice to see you out here. Josh, nice to see you. Uh, we were just talking about you, Karina. Um, uh, okay. So I hope everyone's doing pretty good. Um, I'm in my, seems like I'm in a dark place. I guess I kind of am. Uh, for those who know me, obviously Jeff and all that. For those showing up here whose names I don't recognize, I'm Jeff DePotsy. I'm the... Uh, CEO of the SFE and the creator of the process and uh, an ex operator and stuff like that. Uh, I just want to speak on a little bit about why we're doing this. Um, so as part of our group, um, I'm just going through scrolling here, guys, sorry. Uh, we believe in order to thrive, to truly thrive, you have to know how to survive, right? If your environment's constantly putting you into a survival mindset, uh, you're not going to be able to thrive overall. It's good to go into survival and come out of it, you know, stress, the nervous system, post-traumatic growth, all that stuff we believe in. Um, but we don't want to allow our environment to constrict us down uh, because in constriction, our mind starts to shut down. We're not able to make holistic decisions with all the information available. And what happens is that's the land of skills and drills that starts to kick in things that you've learned and autopiloted a little bit more. So we wanted to give uh, one of these um, skills for something that we all love to do, which is travel. And um, we all know that it can be a wormhole to growth, uh, but it can also you know, get us in trouble. Um, even in 100% um, fully permissive countries. So we asked Boris from uh, True North Tradecraft to come out and uh, give a little talk on this for now, I'm gonna hand over uh, hosting capabilities to him and he's gonna take you through and then uh, we can do a little questions and answers and such after. Um, so go ahead, Boris, I'm gonna give you control. You uh, do what you gotta do, buddy. 
Outstanding. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Boris Malinkovich. Uh, I own and operate True North Tradecraft. And um, today we're going to talk a little bit about travel security uh, and uh, security of the self on the move. So I'm just going to share my screen with you guys. So stand by. Everybody see that? Open so. Ta da. All right. Yeah, it's good to go, Boris. We can see it. Okay, cool. All righty. So uh, I'll do a couple of uh, little housekeeping bits and pieces um, uh, just to kind of get going with it. Oh, there we go. All right, so legal disclaimer, um, essentially what it says is nothing that I say is foolproof. Um, the, the thing about travel and the thing about these kinds of environments, uh, when you travel, when you train tactically and all that sort of stuff, uh, there are no guarantees in them. So uh, these are my best suggestions for the circumstances that we'll be speaking about. And uh, all the risks are kind of borne by you if you go ahead and uh, follow any of this stuff in the uh, in the real world, but uh, I've done everything possible to make it as accurate as possible. Um, again, don't support any uh, breaking of laws. Um, some of this information can be interpreted as as unlawful or harmful if misused. Uh, do your due diligence and know your local laws uh, and the consequences for your actions. Therefore, we are technically giving this presentation for informational educational use only and ultimately you are responsible for your actions that's what the lawyers tell me i have to say all right so a little bit about myself um first off i don't take myself too seriously um in when i'm in a presentation like this uh like to kind of make some jokes on my own behest but uh, a little bit about myself so again my name is boris malinkovich uh Currently, I'm employed with the federal government in Canada as a regional manager in charge of uh, national security concerns. Um, uh, the CBCP is a certified business continuity professional. I have that certification. I joined the Canadian Armed Forces as a reservist in 1998 uh, with the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry and uh, did that for a chunk of years. Then I moved to intelligence. And then I moved to military police, which is where I technically currently reside. For all you military guys, don't judge me on the MP thing. And uh, and um, uh, I'm just about to be released uh, any day now. So I'm just waiting for my paperwork to come through. Uh, in line with that, I was with uh, the CBSA, Canada Customs, uh, for five years with the, the beginning of my uh, public service career. And my last year was with a special enforcement unit there. Uh, after that, I did 12 years with Transport Canada Security, uh, doing uh, aviation and marine security, uh, emergency preparedness, and national security concerns. Uh, over that time, I started True North Tradecraft, so here we are. Uh, I'm also a certified instructor in uh, situational awareness. Uh, and for the progressive restraint escape system. So it, that's to uh, get out of restraints of various kinds. Um, and that was done through FORTAC 5 Carlo D in Britain. I'm a member of the Canadian Tactical Officers Association, and I'm a published author, uh, two books, and uh, I've done a fair amount of speaking, uh, podcasts, that sort of thing. But also, I'm very much an avid traveler. So currently, I stand at 24 countries uh, visited, and I'm looking at another three to four this year. So uh, wh when I put all of it together, uh, I have a bit of a system of how I do things when I travel, and uh, uh, it serves me quite well. So two things that I like to kind of go with um, in my little quotes there, you have to be willing to be uncomfortable to do what others can't uh, or won't in order to grow. So that's really in line with what Jeff was talking about and uh, a reason that I, I really kind of vibe what uh, the message that uh, the Special Forces experience is, is putting out. And I tend to find myself in those uncomfortable positions when I'm uh, trying to take the next step forward uh, in life. 
And uh, from a personal security standpoint, <laughs> when seconds count, the police are only minutes away. Isn't that the truest thing ever? So uh, if you're if you're going to think that somebody's going to save your ass when things go badly, uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, you are your own response and you should be taking responsibility for yourself. So we're going to try and give you some skills and best practices to uh, be your own kind of response and to get yourself out of a jam. Uh, so it's a bit of kind of the stuff that I've done. Uh, so here are the books down at the bottom that I've currently got published. I've done articles for various magazines. I've uh, been on the news, uh, guest speaker, uh, keynote speaker at the Analytica Intelligence Conference, CFB Kingston. I've done training for Google, uh, et cetera. So I've, I've got a weird mix of various backgrounds. And uh, when I put them all together, I find that I fit into this kind of genre pretty well. Uh, so... Of course, when you put it all together, then this is what you have, right? So I'm far better than all these guys put together. Um, haha, Jeff, yeah, you're gonna gonna laugh at that one. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, um, no, I, I I wasn't spec ops in any way, uh, but uh, my beard is better than than the mustache or anything else. But uh, yeah, when uh, when we look at some of the kind of uh, Hollywood versions of some of the stuff that we cover uh, at True North Tradecraft, it's you know, the Hollywoodized versions of, of some of this stuff. Um, and we we keep it just kind of bare bones. So we're looking at what we're going to talk about tonight. Who needs this information? Well, tourists in general, if you're traveling anywhere outside of your home turf and you're not completely or intimately aware of it, um, it's going to be useful to you. Traveling professionals, hospitality, uh, tourism workers, sales reps, so people that travel by themselves to go sell stuff in other places. High profile individuals, so people that have an actual public profile uh, or a high net wealth, uh, high net worth, um, that sort of things, or people that work with um, next point targeted industry members. So that's you and as an individual are not very worthwhile per se, but the company you work for is big. So mining companies, defense co uh, companies, uh, military, pharma, construction, that sort of stuff. Anyone who finds themselves in an unfamiliar place while away from home. Unfortunately, also women make up the biggest part of that group because they're going to be targeted by men more often than not. Okay, so why do we have, why do we focus on uh, security, uh, security for ourselves? Well, uh, in the movie Bestseller, the main character, Clive, puts it really well. He says, anyone can kill anyone, even the president. And uh, that's true. Uh, if we're not taking responsibility for ourselves, we're putting ourselves at the mercy of somebody else. Um, now, when we're looking at that, we're looking at it generally through the lens of violence uh, and violence being used as a tool to achieve an objective. Uh, when we're looking at the context of travel, generally violence is going to be violence or its threatened use is going to be used to relieve you of your goods uh your valuables etc uh but sometimes at at risk to you and uh, as tim larkin says violence is almost never the answer but when it is it is the only answer and um uh generally what what i suggest to people is that we're going to try and avoid a, an actual violent confrontation as much as possible. Someone wants your wallet and pulls a knife, here you go. It's not worth rolling the die on the outcome of that uh, if if you don't have to. Uh, your wallet's replaceable. Uh, you know, your, your heart, liver, kidneys, lungs are not uh, generally. So uh, we're, we're looking at trying to avoid violence as much as possible and the impact it might have on us and our loved ones. Okay, so following that, so why security so specifically? Well, if we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, at the bottom, we have those basic physiological needs, which is the air, the water, the food, the, the heat, the bioregulation, uh, thermoregulation. Uh, those are the, the basics we need. But the next, um, we need safety and security uh, for our person, for our, the integrity of our person. If we can't be secure, we can't 
continue to build on top of that. We can't have those safe relationships with people, building intimate relationships and friendships, et cetera, feeling self-esteem and prestige and accomplishment and doing things and growing as a person. If you're not reasonably secure, you're not going to be snuffed out immediately thereafter, right? So we, we want to focus on establishing a level of security so we can go about our daily lives. Okay. Um, but security protects your life ultimately. Uh, but as also it starts to protect your well-being, your reputation, your assets, uh, and your health and those of others as well. Okay. So there's a differentiation between safety and security. Uh, safety is generally being control of the conditions, which are hazards. So things like electricity, for instance, uh, safely dealing with a known hazard is safety, right? Being able to have it work for you or exist without it harming you. Whereas security is an external threat, known or unknown, uh, that may harm you and being able to render them ineffective. Uh, tradecraft is a set of skills uh, in a particular uh, in a particular field. Generally, when that word is used, it refers to espionage. Uh, and personal security is the practice of um, those procedures and techniques against threats, known and unknown. All right, so we want to keep you safe and secure. We want to increase the awareness of your environment. Um, that's going to be one of the, the most important pieces that I'm going to go back to uh, several times during this presentation is uh, your situational awareness is the foundation of your safety and security. If you don't know what's going on around you, you cannot orientate and action uh, yourself to be able to deal with those threats. In doing so, you're controlling fear responses, as well as increasing the confidence that you have in being able to deal with that situation. Uh, that'll allow you to ideally take control of the situation and become capable, adaptive, and resilient to, um, to adversity. Okay. So when we look at violence and people, um, it's important to, uh, to note that violence happens where people are. Uh, if you're in the middle of a desert and there's no people around, nobody's really gonna assault you, right? Stands to reason. But if you're in a crowd, the more people and the, the larger mix of people, and when you have uh, greater gaps and differences between them, you are going to start to increase the chances of having strife between individuals or between groups, okay? Um, so violence happens where people are. Uh, generally, uh, it can be certain individuals or groups are targeted. It can also be that a certain location is targeted, uh, but it can also be uh, terrorism, uh, personal and petty crime. There's a whole mix of how and why violence is used um, but generally, in a travel context, uh, we're going to look at you're a tourist, you don't belong there generally, um, you're not part of the, the local landscape, and um, uh, it's going to be all of those things. Individual, you're a tourist, you don't, you don't belong there. Location, it's a tourist trap of sorts, so you're going to, or a train station or something, and that's where a lot of pickpockets or petty theft is going to happen. Or terrorism, they know that it's an area frequented by uh, tourists of a various kind, and they're trying to make a point by blowing something up there, okay? So also in the context of travel, which doesn't have to do with violence, is natural disasters, okay? Um, they, they're possibly predictable or not, uh, you know, saying that the hurricane season is coming through in a certain area, uh, Generally, you know, November is hurricane season, so don't go to Florida, right? Uh, so that's that's an example of can be predicted. Earthquakes, for instance, may not be. Uh, winter storms or something like that may not be, or you might have just a little bit of warning with it. Uh, so depending on where you go, uh, you know, Iceland, for instance, very, very um, a geologically active. Uh, volcanoes are a big thing there. so. It's something you might want to consider in your planning. 
Um, the scale varies. So natural disasters can be something small. It could be a you know a little tremor of an earthquake, but it could also be a tsunami that wipes out you know a, a whole coastline. So uh, depending on what the hazards are for that area, uh, you know it, the scale can definitely vary. Uh, due to that, those disasters, your exit may be compromised. So if you flew into an airport that's on the coast and they have a hurricane, that airport may no longer be usable and uh, you may not be able to exit that area via that means. Um, can't stop the weather. Uh, there's nothing you can do to, uh, to stop or dissuade natural disasters, but what you can do is manage them to some degree. Um, and when it comes to the post-incident and beyond, uh, being able to be adaptable to those changing environments uh, and those changing circumstances as you make your way to it, an area of safety. Okay, so if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. Um, one of those kind of cliched little, uh, uh, little quotes, but it's very true. Uh, if you're not planning your trip out and something doesn't go absolutely perfectly, <clears throat> You may not know what to do and you may not be able to deal with it well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now what? All right. So let's talk pre-travel. Um, so this is really essential. Uh, having things set up and um, developing an awareness of where you're going, what you're going to be doing, and the environment that you're going to be in. Um, this is something that I take very seriously, whether it's uh, like a weekend getaway uh, or uh, I'm going for several weeks or traveling on a on a big trip somewhere. So you want to make sure that you're familiar where you're going, uh, dangerous areas that you want to avoid, and you want to set up plans for contingencies in case something goes wrong. We all hope nothing's going to go wrong, but if it does go wrong, you're going to be thankful that you took the, the time to actually plan out uh, some backups. So a couple of things we want to do is you want to leave a copy of your itinerary, your passport, medical and travel insurance, recent photo of yourself, uh, ideally like a day or two before you leave, taking a selfie and sending it, all that stuff, contact numbers, addresses, um, and leaving it with someone you trust. So someone who's going to be your home base uh, in case something goes wrong. So if there's a disaster and the embassy is looking for Canadians in that country, um, the person you've left your stuff with is going to be able to contact the embassy and say, oh, I know Boris is, is out there. They left me all this documentation. Here's the flight they came in on. Here's their, this is what he looks like. This is his passport. Um, and this is his phone number. This is his email address. Um, you can try and get in contact with him so he can check in. He might not be able to check in, okay? Um, so having having a, a stack of that sent to a friend, now you can scan it or make a hard copy. Um, what I tend to do is I will have copies, electronic copies of all of this, and I'll email it to myself. I'll email it to somebody else. I'll email it to one or two different email addresses. And I'll also put it in a cloud account so that even if it's not on my phone anymore, if I lose my phone and I don't have access, I can go to any internet cafe or I can give myself up to a to an embassy and say, um, hey, I've got copies of all my IDs. They're in a cloud or I can I can log into my email and I can show you everything. OK, um, ideally, you want a hard copy of everything um in your pack somewhere or on your person when you travel so you'll have your actual passport you'll have your actual id but then you have a paper copy of everything um an example of this is uh so i went to holland last summer to, to europe and you weren't allowed to travel back to canada even though i'm canadian um they wouldn't let you on the plane without your vaccine paperwork OK, now to upload it onto the arrive can, you have to get on your phone on an app in Amsterdam and upload it. Well, the problem is, is that 
they were having some significant issues in Amsterdam uh, with uh, with cell phones and reception and that sort of stuff and their Wi-Fi. And my Arrive Can app did not work. Um, couldn't get it to work. And they were going to not allow me on the flight uh, because I wasn't able to prove that I had that uh, that documentation and that it was not set up. So I actually had a copy of it. I was able to show them on paper. They were able to log in and do some backward kind of way of allowing me on the flight because I actually had a copy of it. But if I was just relying on my phone, uh, they they would not have allowed me on the flight, which again is a, absurd, but neither here nor there. It's always good to have a backup, always good to have a copy of it, okay? So, we want to we want to take a look at a couple of advisories and stuff like that for where we're going to be going. So research is going to be a key uh, key component here. Uh, one of the good places to go to is going to be the if if you're Canadian, uh, the foreign affairs website. So uh, there on the screen is travel.gc.ca, um, and that has all the travel advisories for all the countries around the world. Um, Department of State in the U.S. does the same thing, and the um, Foreign Office in Britain, uh, same thing. So you can go to their website, and they will have, like here on the screen, uh, you know, here we go, New Zealand, take normal safety precau security precautions. Uh, you know, Guatemala, Pakistan, and Mexico, and Turkey. Not exactly at the top of the list of places you, you want to go right now. Um, and so... The, it'll have a listing. It'll have the reasons why uh, it's not always going to be uh, criminal or uh, violent in nature. Uh, some of the places the uh, travel advisor will pop up and be there's a cyclone on the way for this area or it was just hit by an earthquake. Don't go there. It's it's not really uh, safe from a from a uh, weather or climate perspective. OK, um, so those are those. That's your start. Uh, going to those sites and, and just reading about what uh, what you've got to expect when you hit the ground there, okay? Um, you want to also take a look. So if I'll use my 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 trip from last summer as a as an example. So look at Amsterdam. Uh, uh, I I'd never been there before, so I was looking at you know, maps. I was wanting to orientate myself. Okay, the, I'm flying in here. Um, and uh, this is where the airport is. This is the direction that I have to travel from the airport to the city. It's a general rough direction. When I get there, you know, uh, the, the ocean's on this side, you know, the water's over here, my hotel's here. So I know that's generally north, west, all that sort of stuff. And you get a feel for what the landmarks are, what the orientation of the city is, north, south, east, west. Um, some cities around the world will have a river, and you'll know that the river is, you know, goes north, south, or east, west, or diagonally. But generally, if you're in this part of town, the river is going to be on this side. If you're this part, it's going to be vice versa. And you have already a growing idea of how to orientate yourself and knowing where you're generally going. Okay. From there, can print off a map. Ideally, I like a paper map uh, in addition to a downloaded map, but uh, I'll take a print uh, printed off uh, Google map or one that I get in paper and I'll start drawing stuff on it or or listing point, uh, points of interest. Things like where my embassy is going to be. Um, so uh, th that's going to be very important. If there is a disaster, if there is... Um, if there's, if there's a disaster, a problem, if you have anything that might come up, uh, the, your consulate or embassy is going to be uh, likely your first point of contact or where you want to get to. Um, also, making note of who your friendly embassies are. So in different parts of the world, uh, there may not be a Canadian embassy, for instance, uh, but there might be a British embassy or uh, an American embassy or a consulate or a high commission. Uh, those are various levels of, of service. So cons um, embassy, consulate, commission, that sort of thing. Um, but I can go to another Commonwealth country as a Canadian 
with a Canadian passport and walk into an Australian embassy and say, hey, I need help. Okay. And they will bring me in uh, and I will be afforded uh, very similar supports as I would walking into my own country. Okay. Uh, so knowing who your friendly embassies are, uh, are important. Uh, if you are a, an EU passport holder and you belong to an EU nation or European Union nation, you with your European Union passport can walk into any other European Union embassy and be afforded the same protections. Even though you're not a citizen of that country, uh, generally you will be afforded um, consular help on the basis that you're all part of the EU. Now, certain countries will be more friendly than others, but generally these are things that you want to know if you know your country is goes well with this country, you can look for those embassies as well. Okay. So understanding the lay of the land and understanding who your friends are when you're on the ground. Okay. Um, taking the time to learn some local languages and local phrases, really simple stuff. Hello, goodbye, yes, no, please, thank you. Um, excuse me, sorry, um, as a Canadian, sorry. Um, these are very simple words. Uh, and they will go a long way. Now, an example of this is I have found in my experiences traveling and not always speaking the language of where I'm gone going. If I know a few words and I'm trying to say something in, in a native tongue, obviously I'm not a native speaker. Obviously, it's very apparent I'm I'm not from there. But the effort that you're putting in to try and communicate with somebody local helps to bridge the gap between being just a stupid tourist and somebody that's really trying to be part of the culture and enjoy the culture for culture's sake. And you'll see, I've seen it very, very, very often. I've been in line with, with somebody in front of me who's just like, why can't you speak English? And they, they just yell at the person in speaking English, they're like, oh, I want this, rather than saying, you know, case que sera, uh, combien de dollars, uh, you know, and they'll, they don't even try. They just expect everybody to speak what their language. And the person at the till probably speaks English better than I do, but on the point of principle, they're not going to because they're being disrespected. Coming in and speaking a few words of their language and you're genuinely trying or you have a little guidebook and you you point something and you try and speak it out puts that person in a different context with you and they're far more likely to help you and to be more supportive of what you're trying to achieve okay so learning those little things goes a long way second figuring out what signs mean now generally stop signs are kind of universal you know don't go this way is like a circle with a line through it you know uh wrong way one way road signs are pretty self-explanatory and there's a lot of international signs um at airports at bus stations at train stations the signs will do a lot of the talking for you now if you if there are specific ones that you may be coming across because of the work you're doing or the type of travel you're doing you might want to look up what that word actually looks like in that language and get to know that word. You know, like if if you see a sign, if you're walking along, um, you know, the Croatian Riviera and you see a sign that says Zimmer, I don't know about you, but that's not a Croatian word. It's a German word, but it means the same thing. Rooms for let. Um, it's a place like, you know, a, a villa or something like that that you can you can rent a room at. And it's because depending on the, the tourists that generally go to that area, they'll sometimes put signs for that to cater to that particular group versus another group that's not there as much. So depending on where you're traveling, you might want to work, learn different words for that particular thing you're looking for or universal signs. Some of the guidebooks will have just like a, a picture of what those signs are that are generally accepted in that area to mean a certain thing. So picture speaks um, more loudly than words do sometimes, but it's it's something you should take the extra time to actually do. 
Um, doing a like we we all have access to Google, so under, having an understanding of what the local customs are that you're going to be dealing with, uh, and their taboos sometimes more more importantly is not only going to help you maintain the respect and rapport between yourself and locals, but also not to get you into trouble as readily, okay? Um, like certain things I was um, jokingly admonished by a friend of mine who's Italian because I went like this to her. And apparently if you're from the North of Italy, that means one thing not exactly what I was going for in the text back and forth. So uh, she's like, it because it's you, I know you're not you're not really trying to say what I think you're trying to say, but she's like, you're just, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna educate you on that. So doing doing something in one that works in your culture doesn't necessarily make it okay in a different culture or it's going to be taken differently. So take some time to find out what those things are. Uh, how you dress, religious uh, observances, things that you might want to be sensitive to. Um, you know, you, you don't really want to go, uh, you're not going to really go to a Muslim country and say, yeah, can I get uh, bacon and eggs, right? It's, it's not something that's, that's going to work well in that, in that particular context. So you want to know what the local customs are, you want to know what the locals are doing, and you want to know why? Because you want to fit in a little bit better. So you don't scream, I'm a tourist, come rob me. Okay. Um, local food and drink. Um, so if you've been to a resort, uh, kind of in the Caribbean and stuff like that, a lot of times you read reviews of certain resorts and they'll say, don't drink the water. Make sure it's only bottled water or, or you're going to have a bad day, a you know, bad trip. Um, and other resorts will say, no, they have water purification on site, you can drink water from the tap, you'll be fine. These are local bits and pieces that you're going to want to know. Coming in from the outside, the locals can drink that tap water because they've been doing it all their lives and it's not going to affect them, but it may affect you. So reading a bit about how that local way affects travelers coming in from outside is something you might want to take into consideration. If you have sensitivities to certain things, if you're on medication, you might want to make sure that you have a bit extra for that, okay? And um, without a doubt, be respectful to all the locals you meet, okay? Respect goes a long way. Um, you're, you're in somebody else's country and be respectful of it, um, especially children and the elderly. Um, keep that in mind. If you disrespect a child or an elder, um, you're you're generally in for a bad time because it's going to piss everybody off. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, again, a little more research, uh, local crime rates and hotspots. So uh, a lot of that stuff is going to come up in your um, looking at State Department and um, Foreign Affairs websites and stuff like that with the travel advisories. But a, a quick like Reddit search or something on the destinations you're going to. Uh, people sometimes post stuff like, you know what, uh, pickpockets are really active in uh, this particular market. So be aware of that, right? They they really focus on that market because a lot of tourists go there. But if you go to the market three three streets down, it's only locals and nobody bothers you. So little tips like that, but having an idea that, uh, you know, certain parts uh, can be more violent, more violent crime. Uh, you might want to avoid those areas. Okay, uh, pickpocketing and mugging, that sort of stuff. Um, another point is you want to maintain your diligence when you're out and about. Um, getting drugged uh, is a thing that happens. Like people go to clubs, it's really easy, uh, or bars, restaurants, anything like that, where you're not paying attention to your drink, you can really have someone drop something in there. And next thing you know, you're the victim of a sexual assault or kidnapping. Uh, and, you know, you, it's just a bad scene all around. So um, maintaining the di diligence, meeting people by chance. Oh, look at us. We're, we're both tourists. We should go party. Um, you don't know these people and um, 
you know, have, have an idea of, uh, of what you're getting into. But um, um, with that, you can learn about what are your options for the carriage of weapons? Is the, is the country permissive in their, um, in their laws for being able to carry something to protect yourself with, or is it non-permissive? So um, for instance, Canada, you basically can't carry anything. Uh, so, you know, getting caught with, with something is going to cause you some real problems. Okay. So we've done all our research. Uh, we've got everything prepped up and, um, uh, and, and off we go. So let's talk some travel. Okay. So awareness. Uh, sure. A lot of people have seen this breakdown of situational awareness. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go over it. So this is called the Cooper's color, uh, color code. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Cooper, uh, U.S. military, came up with this awareness coding. And uh, generally, it goes as, as it says. White, you're kind of oblivious. It's like when you've woken up in the morning, no threats of any kind. You're in a safe environment. Yellow, you're aware of your surroundings, but you're generally calm. Orange, heightened state of awareness. You're switched on, but you're not afraid or anything, right? Um, but you're, 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 you're definitely aware. And then red is there's intense focus because something's happening that's directly threatening you and uh, action is eminent. And then uh, we get into black, which uh, is when you're overwhelmed by the uh, uh, your heart rate and the uh, stimulus coming in. And you're in that kind of fight or flight uh, freeze situation. You lose a lot of perception, control, high heart rate tunnel vision, all that sort of stuff, and you start to lose control over your uh, cognitive functions in a stressful environment. So um, what we want to do is we uh, we don't want to get into that black. We would like to stay kind of even out of the red, but hovering between yellow and orange. It's kind of our ideal. Okay. So what are we supposed to be aware of? Okay. So here's a, here's a video of awareness, okay? And I, I like to show this particular video um, to illustrate how um, a, a lack of awareness can, can truly set you up for a bad go. So don't know if anyone saw that, but it was really subtle. Okay, I'm gonna try and play it again. So the, the blonde girl who's doing the selfie, she's holding a cup. Keep your eyes on the cup. Whoa. Hold on, okay. So keep your eyes on Blondie's cup. <laughs> So you see it on the second time around. So that guy dropped something into her cup. Okay. Basically, he's dropped a roofie into her cup and who knows what, what and how that evening ended. Probably not well. Okay. Um, it's a really good illustration of how quickly just looking away from what you've got going on in your hand can turn into something very, very bad uh, an hour later. And guaranteed, she has absolutely no idea that that happened, okay? Unless she looked at the video later on, right? Or saw it in some miraculous way, but she didn't seem too switched on with it. So um, th that's why I use that particular clip. It's, it's disturbing because it can happen so quickly. So, um, and if you're out anywhere, you want to keep keep an eye on your drink, you know, keep a thumb over your beer bottle, right? Um, you know, make sure it's opened in your presence that you, you know, you, you have it. Be aware of what's going on around you. If you don't trust the people that are around you, don't act as if you do trust them, right? Um, take steps to keep that control. Okay. Um, so in situational awareness, we want to establish what the norm is in our environment. 
Now, um, you're all asking what 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 does this have to do with travel? It's it huge because we need to establish this stuff um, to be able to go forth through our environment uh, and be able to observe, identify, and manage risks as they as they come up. So what is the norm in our environment? That's what we talk, call our baseline, okay? The baseline is what is normal for that environment, okay? And how we establish that is basically by getting a feel for it. Now, that can take some time on ground, but think of it this way. A good example is in those Western movies where there's like that one horse town and the, the, the drifter walks in down the main little drag and people are looking out their windows and start to close all the shutters and stuff like that. Well, that, that kind of makes things a little weird, right? Um, because one minute everybody's happy and the next minute everybody's picking up their children and walking away. Uh, that's an indication that something is wrong, okay? So the baseline is what is normal. And anomalies is what is above baseline and what is below baseline. Above baseline would be what is present that shouldn't be present. So if we're looking at a war zone or something, Afghanistan, um, you know, roadside bomb type thing. Like the road, the road looks fine, but there's, you know, a pile of garbage that wasn't there yesterday, or the road has a some upturned soil across the middle of it. That is something that is there that shouldn't be there. And that is some anomaly that we should be picking up on, okay? So that's an extreme example, but that is that is an example of it, okay? What is below baseline is what isn't there but should be, okay? So for instance, if you walk through a neighborhood and uh, there's no children playing in a kind of family neighborhood, there's no children about, or people outside walking around down the sidewalk, or um, if it's a tropical country outside the local corner store, sitting on a chair, having a, you know, having a cerveza or something like that. Those are normal, generally normal things going on. But if they're not present, one would want to ask themselves, why? Why is that not? Why is that anomaly there? So when we can start to identify those anomalies, we can start to ask ourselves that question, what's the problem here? Sometimes it's a completely innocuous reason as to why something is or isn't there. But generally, if we are not aware of those anomalies, we are at the mercy of the environment there. Okay, so we need to be able to pick up on what's wrong. Um, for instance, I live in downtown Toronto. If I were to walk through the financial district pre-COVID, uh, on like a Wednesday at 8.30 in the morning, the baseline would be tens of thousands of suits running around with their coffees and their, and their cell phones, pushing past one another, trying to get into office towers, okay? Um, generally speaking, that is the baseline, that is the norm, okay? If I walked into that environment and there was at that same time of week, day and week, 8.30 in the morning, and there's nobody on the street, that is a massive problem, right? Where are those tens of thousands of people that should be there? And I'd have to ask myself, well, my thought would be they closed off the street because they're filming a movie. Um, or or there's like, like a bomb threat somewhere that I just happen to walk into. Um, but you got to ask yourself, why is it like that? Flip side is, if you walk in there, and, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of people that are not dressed in suits walking around. Um, let's say in black balaclavas, head to toe dressed in black, carrying crowbars. Probably a good indication that there is something wrong there that is outside that norm. And I should be asking myself, why is there a crowd of, of people walking through the street dressed and acting as such? So when you see that overseas, you turn the corner and you know, yesterday you were there and that street looked nice. It had cafes and all this sort of stuff. And then today those cafes are closed and there's nobody walking on those streets. You might want to ask yourself what's going on. Again, could just be a Sunday or, or a holiday that you weren't aware of and that's normal. 
uh, and not a threat, but it also could mean something else that the shop owners knew that something was going to go on because they're local and you're not. So understanding what the baseline is in and the norm in your environment is huge, huge uh, in regards to your situational awareness. Okay. Um, so knowing what those hazards, those threats, the environment and the geography of your area is will play a part in your situational awareness. Okay. Um, also having an idea of the people and their interactions with each other and their environment. That's things like how locals will, will act towards one another if there's gangs involved or areas of the town that are controlled by certain factions. Um, they may they may orientate themselves or be anchored to a particular geographic location. And that is going to be part of what your awareness is going to be built around. Because when you cross the street, you're in that territory now. And that's going to have a different flavor than the other territory you just walked out of. Okay. Um, so we're going to observe as we go through our, our day, we're going to assess things as they start popping out, uh, as outside of the baseline, we're going to look at behavioral, environmental, social, geopolitical, um, how those, those people are, are presenting. So, uh, for instance, you know, I walk around downtown all the time. I happen to walk by, um, 1001 Queen street, which is, um, Canadian uh, Addiction and Mental Health uh, Hospital, and there's a lot of crazies there, okay? Um, some people just, you know, the, the, just the way they are, it is what it is. Uh, there's a lot of drug addicts and stuff like that, uh, emotionally disturbed people, and, and you'll see anomalous behaviors in that area far more than, than some others, right? Um, but being aware of that, and sometimes they are harmful and sometimes they're not or threatening and uh, sometimes they're not. But having the wherewithal that you can identify someone behaving in a manner that is not normal generally um, is should be drawing your attention so that you can start positioning or taking steps to deal with that should it become necessary. Environmental. You know, if you see it, if you see a sinkhole in the middle of the street, don't walk into it. Right. Like, but if you don't see it and you just kind of on your phone, you walk into it or you uh, a crack in the sidewalk. These are things that your awareness should be able to help you stay out of social and geopolitical. So, again, if there's like factions, if there's uh, civil unrest or riots or protests and stuff like that, these are all things that start to pop up that you might want to take uh, note of and probably distance yourself from. OK. Uh, make your determinations uh, and then act in a way that's going to minimize the impact that those uh, those events or those people are going to have on you. Best thing I can suggest is put down your phone. Um, even here at home, um, the picture in the in the slide there. I see it every day. Um, your phone is going to be probably one of the biggest impediments to your situational awareness. Uh, it, it takes all your attention away from what should be going on around you and that you can start to take in that stimuli and make those assessments and, and, and build those observations for yourself. But generally your phone is going to take that away from you. Okay. So, um, if you don't have to act, if you're not actually using it actively, Put it away, put your, you know, start scanning in front of you and start taking in that stimulus and, uh, and, you know, be aware of what's going on around you. Okay. So can't say it any more plainly than that. Just put your phone away. Um, if you're going to use it, step aside. Um, when I'm on the side, when I'm walking down the sidewalk or something, uh, or I'm driving and I need to make a call or I need to check text messages or send an email. I'll pull over and I'll, I'll take the 30 seconds and deal with it. Um, if I'm walking on the sidewalk, I won't just stop in the middle of the sidewalk and, and be on my phone. I take a step out into a doorway where I can be, have my back against something and kind of be aware of what's going on in front of me while still dealing with my call. 
but at least it puts me out of the traffic, the human traffic, and gives me a slightly better position from which to observe my surroundings. Okay. Uh, so uh, a note on endemics. So if you're in different parts of the world, um, there will be there will be groups or people that will present in a certain way that is likely going to increase your level of threat. And you might want to put yourself out of that situation, um, if at all possible. Now, depending on, you know, if you're there for um, some kind of work that calls for you to be involved with these types of individuals, well, that's a different story and outside the scope of what we're talking about. But generally, you know, if you see tattoos or, um, you know, if you're in a certain part of, you know, California and a lot of people are wearing red, and you're the one lone person wearing blue or vice versa, probably going to have a bad time. Um, you know, walking into a bar where a lot of people are wearing jackets that say Hell's Angels on them, and um, you're not wearing something like that, probably going to get the wrong kind of attention. Uh, tattoos on your fingers and knuckles uh, of various kinds, probably that kind of bar or restaurant, unless you got business there, probably better to go look somewhere else. Um, Mexico, uh, you know, the Santa Muerte, uh, uh, you're going to see all kinds of iconography coming from that. Um, tattoos, jewelry, shrines, stuff like that. If, if you're not going to be involving yourself to that degree, probably are looking at, um, you know, better to move on. Okay, so these are symbols uh, that will come up and this is just an example, but understanding what is going on in the area that you're going to visit, and that can be done through your uh, your pre-trip research. Uh, you know, look out for this kind of insignia, or look out for that. Uh, you know, make a note of it, make a mental note of it, and um, and be aware. Okay. So, you know, does. When we're walking into that area, so going back to my point about the kind of Western uh, thing, you know, we walk in, does the feel of the environment, what, what is it? Is it positive? Is it negative? You know, do you just feel off when you walk, you know, turn the corner or something? If it does, you got to start asking yourself why, what's happened, what's changed? Um, do the locals seem happy um, or are they subdued? Are they kind of you know, their eyes downcast and stuff like that. This is going to give you an idea of to the environment that you've just stepped in. And is that somewhere that you want to be or just quickly make your way out of? Um, if every if everything is great one minute and then, you know, a flashy car drives in or something like that and everybody starts going into their shops and their towns picking or in their townhouses or whatever, picking their children up and taking them off the street, you should probably take your cue from that. Uh, generally because they know what's going on far better than you do. And it's a huge indicator of trouble. Okay. So uh, when we're going to be packing for our trip, a um, couple of considerations to have. Um, first off, what do your clothes say about you? Okay. Um, the picture I have there, I couldn't help. It's like, you know, um, the undercover um closet that they raided you know from 511 it's like we're 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 just you know we're just two dudes hanging out on a street corner but we're we're in 511 clothing that's designed for undercover operators um you know what do your clothes say about you so are you dressed like a tourist are you dressed like a local um you know how how have you put yourself together do you look rich uh do you look you know, average, what is it going to be? What do you, what do your clothes say about you? And think to yourself when you put your clothes on, um, what does it say about you? Um, and what are you going for? Right. Uh, capable. So do your, do your, does your outfit help or hinder you? Um, if you're going to be traveling, depending on the type of travel you're doing, uh, you want to, you want to have uh, a wardrobe or you want to be packing stuff that's going to enhance your ability to move. Um, mobility is going to be a, a huge asset should something go wrong. 
and um, uh, you want to be able to, you know, feel good about yourself and achieve the things that you want. You know, you want to go for a nice dinner and dress nice, or you go into a show, all that sort of stuff. That's great. But keep in mind when you're traveling, when you're on the move, um, what do your, you know, what capabilities will you, will your clothes have? Will you be able to stay warm or cool? Or, um, you know, if it's a rainy uh, climate, you know, do you have, do you have a rain jacket, things like that? Are you being, are you dressing and carrying stuff that's appropriate to the location, the climate and the culture that you're visiting? Okay. Uh, keep your jewelry and uh, accessories to a minimum because when you're wearing stuff like a fancy watch or fancy earrings or, or whatever, um, you're, you're on display for people who want to rip you off. And if you're projecting that, you're almost baiting people to pick you up on that sidewalk that they're watching and be like, that person looks like the person that's worth my time and effort to, to have a shot at it, to try and rip them off and try and rob them. Um, and also, do you have the things that you need in case things go wrong? So um, if something goes wrong, you know, do you have good shoes to run out of, out of a situation? Um, if, if there's a disaster or some kind of world event and you can't fly, uh, you can't get to your aircraft because the airport shut down, are you able to traverse uh, terrain? Are you able to, to go elsewhere to get out of that area? Uh, and do, do your clothes and do, do the things that you've packed help you in that? Um, you know, do you have what you need? to uh in case things go wrong whoops hold on so me personally i prefer carry on only if i can get away with it i will uh, pack carry on only uh every time uh sometimes on the on the trip home i might pack a bag but that's because i'm headed home and everything seems to be um uh, seems to be in order um but generally i i travel carry on only Footwear, very important. Um, you want to have footwear um, that on the day to day, if you need to boogie out of a place, if you need to actually like sprint somewhere because you're walking around town and you turn the corner and there's a terrorist attack or there's some civil unrest or there's an active shooter or something like that, that, um, that you're able to actually move. Uh, because that mobility is is going to give you a far higher probability of saving yourself than just sitting there running around with these terrible thong sandals or something like that that are going to break and trip you and it's going to be a bad scene and you won't be able to get to where you want to get to. So you can still find really nice shoes, but are they going to be capable and solid and sturdy to be able to get you where you want to go? Okay. Uh, having a multi-use adaptable capsule wardrobe. So I, I try and go with the bare minimum because if there's something that I feel is, is going to help me adapt to that environment best, I'll bring the basics. I'll bring my underwear, my socks, you know, like some la um, base layers or one or two pieces, but then I'll go shopping. Okay. Part of travel is going shopping. And you can go and you can pick up stuff that is local that will make you look like a local. If you walk into a local store and you buy a shirt that a lot of other people that live there have bought, uh, you're, it's going to stand to reason until you open your mouth that uh, that you're just another local. So having the the option of having a souvenir at the same time as being able to blend in is is great. Also, you you got there with carry on. So at the end of the day, if it's, unless it's really expensive, uh, you can con consider just leaving it behind or take it with you if depending on how much you, uh, space you have. Okay. Um, but you know, if, if things go wrong, do you have what you need? And, um, you know, things like medications, um, do you have, um, small extras, like little things, um, I, I tend to carry a whole list of little things in my bag uh, to make repairs and to make my life easier when I'm at a hotel or on the move, okay? 
A um, couple things when we're on the move. Never leave your bags unattended. Um, uh, I worked at an airport for 17 years. And I, I tell you that one of the worst things you can do to yourself and the law enforcement that's there is leaving an unattended bag. Uh, we used to come across them, look around, nobody there. All right, off it goes. Cops would take it and go and, uh, you know, off goes your bag for, for emergency screening and stuff like that. Sure enough, five minutes later, buddy comes back. He's like, oh, I just went to the bathroom. Okay, well, you're not going to get your bag back for a couple of hours now because it's gone to uh, like an x-ray machine out in the middle of a field so they could because they think it might be an explosive. So, you know, you're going to have to wait. Oh, you missed your flight. Well, you shouldn't have left your bag unattended in the middle of the airport. So never leave your bag unattended. That's And that's like, only one thing that could happen. The other thing is, depending on where you are in the world, somebody could steal something from your bag if it's unattended. But even scarier is somebody could introduce something into your bag that you don't know. And that can actually get you into far more trouble than you could possibly imagine. Having that happen in a place like, I don't know, uh, Singapore, uh, have someone put a little bag of drugs or something like that into your bag, uh, you that's the end of you. Okay, uh, Saudi Arabia, China, you're dead. Okay, um, so keep control of your bag. And that's another reason I like to travel with carry on only because it's a lot less that you have to carry, like worry about. You don't have to leave your huge roller suitcase outside the bathroom and all that sort of stuff. I've got a bag, uh, you know, small carry on bag and small backpack. And that's it. And I can take that into a bathroom stall and I can have care and control of my stuff at all times. Okay. Um, be aware of people trying to get at your electronics. So this is a, this is a big thing. Uh, one of the, one of the huge kind of things that we're dealing with right now um, is, uh, uh, well, corporate espionage is the best way to put it. Um, so people are always looking to take your information, take your data and um, everything from installing malware onto devices to looking over your shoulder when you're uh, working on your computer in the uh, in the airport lounge um, or uh, hijacking your your uh, Wi-Fi signal and getting into your computer or something like that while you're using public Wi-Fi. Um, all these are possibilities and um, realistically take some steps. Um, so using a VPN, virtual private network to or whenever you're on the internet, but um, especially if you're using public Wi-Fi, it'll help uh, defend your uh, your your devices uh, from from hacking. Um, using, using a USB condom, uh, basically uh, what it is, uh, when you go to a lot of airports now have plugs, it's just a USB-A plug that you plug your phone into, right? Uh, the thing is, is that traditionally most people's charging cables are also data cables, okay? Now, some of those, just like um, card skimmers that exist, uh, some of those USB plugs will actually be replaced by criminal elements, and they will start to be able to, um, to download, without your knowledge, malware onto your device the second you plug it in. So the USB condom, what it does is it, it's just another, like an intermediary device and you uh, you plug your charger into it, and you plug it into the the port, and it has the data ports or the data pins, sorry, removed from it. So all you do is get power, but there's no data transmission. So uh, you can find them on Amazon. Um, Stately Asset Protection um, sells it uh, as one company in the states, but they're they're just little USB like plugs, and they go in. But they're uh, use them all the time when I travel. Another thing is to get a Faraday pouch. Uh, so that's um, uh, a pouch that will shield your device from any kind of intrusion or um, or skimming or anything like that. And it basically just blocks all the radio frequencies from entering or leaving. Um, uh, Mission Darkness sells them. Um, you can use uh, uh, promo code uh, TN Tradecraft, but I, I can post that later if you want. Um, you can save a bit, but they make really good products or they, they make waterproof ones. So you can actually use them like, like boating and stuff like that and whatnot. But, uh, 
uh, having having taken some steps to protect your electronics and your information if you're on a work trip uh that corporate espionage is huge the uh intellectual property someone's going to want to steal it from you depending on the especially uh, if you're in an industry that that is susceptible to that and uh you know don't don't talk to people that you don't know and give them information about what you do and how you do it and where you work and what your boss's name and what your cat's name is like they're strangers they don't need to know that information so what's that's why small talk was invented right so keep your information to you uh and keep your exposure little um when you're on the move uh turn off your geotagging of your photos uh and control your social media personally um I will like I'll still take pictures and stuff like that and of course like you know I'm on vacation I want to Instagram this and that uh and that's cool but I won't do it in the moment that I'm there uh because that gives if someone's looking at you know what am I doing or where am I at that particular moment and someone really wants to target me having my real-time location where I am and plotting out what I'm doing is going to put me at a disadvantage okay oh look I'm staying at the hotel you know Ritz in in Amsterdam oh look look ain't that great oh and then somewhere in the in the corner of the picture I'm holding my room key with the number on it you know like the, these are all things that that put you at a disadvantage if you turn off your geotagging and you control your social media to a way that three days after you were at a location, then you post it, it's no longer relevant to somebody's targeting of you because you're no longer in that location. You can create the illusion through social media that you are in a place or that you are in a place, but you're actually not. So if someone's looking for you and, you're in, and your picture says Toronto, but you're already in Montreal three days later and you post that, then, you know, oh, I'm, I'm in Toronto right now, look at me. I'm, I just ate at this restaurant. Meanwhile, you're you're safely out in Montreal. So um, I tend to do that when I travel, uh, that you can create the illusion of I'm still having a good time. I'm still there. You're still posting, but you're uh, removing yourself from being uh, targeted as a threat. Okay. So something to, something to consider. Um, <clears throat> when you get on the ground, uh, or, or even before, ideally, uh, figure out what your local transportation options are. Some places have good public transport. And if you, uh, if you figure out how the system works, uh, it's far more effective than renting a car or taking a taxi and stuff like that, uh, especially in Europe uh, and vast parts of Asia. Their, their public transit is vastly superior to North America. Uh, don't even get me started on, on Toronto um public transit it's an absolute nightmare um but generally speaking some places have really fantastic public transport and uh if you get yourself a transit map and you figure out you know do you need a uh an oyster card or whatever it is to get through it uh to you know prepay your your tokens or what have you uh you're going to be able to to move around uh much more effectively and you also won't look like as much of a tourist um understanding what the local currency is, what it looks like, and the exchange rates. So um, I don't know if you've seen this before, but like I'm in a market and I'm looking at something and the person beside me is like, how much is this? And then they hold out a wad of cash to the person that's that's running the stall. And it's like, they're like, I don't know how much it is, just take it. Sure enough, the guy's like, okay, I'll just Here's how much it costs, plus an extra 20% for my troubles. And there you go, right? Um, these are things that you're just going to get ripped off with. So to save yourself the hassle, figure out what do the bills look like, uh, the local money. Um, what What is it? What is the currency and what's the exchange rate? So you can go and you something says 500. 500 what? And how much is that in, in Canadian or American dollars or pounds sterling, right? How much is that? And so you have an idea of, are you getting ripped off? Um, and you can see that very often within a tourist environment versus a local environment. And you can go to like a tourist store 
and they have tube of toothpaste for six dollars equivalent right and you're just like holy crap that's a lot but you go to the local two streets down and it's like 50 cents you're like locals are all shopping here why am i not shopping there because the tourist trap knows that you're too stupid to figure that out and you're not looking at the exchange rate because all the tourists just show up and say here take my money because i can't be bothered to figure it out for myself so not being like that nor understanding what the local currency is and those exchange rates will really help you out a lot. So a bunch of stuff that I, oh, okay, sorry. Something just happened to my screen, but it's all good. Um, so packing suggestions. So stuff that I tend to pack in my bag, um, pens. Um, pen and paper, non-tactical pens. So when we're talking about like personal protection and stuff, there's this big kick about like tactical pens. Uh, I'm very much against the, the tactical pen concept, uh, unless you're an in uniform, like law enforcement or military, um, the tactical pen is not going to do you any favors. Uh, it, when we look at it from a, a less or non-permissive -per environment perspective uh so i'll use canada for instance if you walk around with a tactical pen uh something that says tactical on the package uh smith and weston for instance and you end up in an altercation and you end up using that pen against somebody uh you're going to be you're going to be asked well where'd that pen where's that pen from you're going to say well i bought it it's a smith and weston tactical pen well, what's it for self-defense so it's a designed weapon to harm somebody to defend yourself with is that correct and you're going to say yes that's what the design, that's what the manufacturer says now you're going to go from i was i was the victim just defending myself to i was carrying a weapon in anticipation of using it against a person you're going to get done for all kinds of stuff especially here in canada so you don't carry a tactical pen you carry pens now i i like my pens it's either going to be a bic um, for, for some reasons, or I like zebra, uh, Parker, uh, Fisher space pen. They make steel body pens, but they're not tactical pens. It's just a steel pen. Uh, but it's just as effective. Uh, so you can, you can poke a lot of holes in somebody with this, but nobody's ever going to question you on the, the nature of it. And what would it, what was it designed for? Cause it wasn't designed as a tactical pen, right? So if you want to carry something, um, you know, have something that's not designed for the purpose. Um, mini flashlight. So I have like a, a one AAA battery mini flashlight that I carry. It was like uh, from uh, 90s or whatever. Uh, a Bic lighter, a door wedge. This is huge. I carry two of them um, and uh, uh, two rubber door wedges. I throw a piece of um, like a loop of paracord through them. And that is my my security for my uh, my hotel room. Uh, the reason I carry two is one goes in the main door and some hotel rooms have like a door that adjoins to the next door that can be opened uh, between the two and you can kind of create one room between two. Uh, so if I need a second one, I jam it in there. Uh, the loop of the paracord is because if there's a fire and I have to get out really quickly, I don't want to be pissing around with, well, where is this? There's a loop of paracord. I pull it and I'm good to go. Okay. So I'm able to, to actually make an exit, um, which is why I carry a length of uh, uh, paracord, the 550 cord. I also carry some Kevlar cord and some Technora. Now, those two are specific because of the counter custody work that I do. So uh, for you, they're used for cutting restraints. So uh, rope, duct tape, zip ties. Uh, those things are going to be cut through uh, with Kevlar and or Technora. I carry a small roll of duct tape because duct tape fixes pretty much everything. Um, local cash and small denominations. Uh, that's going to be key for you. Uh, if you can get it before you start traveling, do so. Um, go to the bank, order currency if you have the lead time order a small bit of currency. So when you land, you're not like, hey, can, where can I switch my American or Canadian dollars, right? You already have that local cash. You can start to blend in far more easily when you're off the plane. Airports are huge. You're always being observed by criminal elements as you get off an aircraft um, into the public area. And people are starting to 
identify marks. Um, the Canadian, the, a couple of years back, uh, the Canadian passport was assessed at being valued at approximately between ten and fifty thousand dollars U.S. on the black market, because it's one of the uh, better passports that can be used um, to travel to more countries. So, depending on the country that it would be hawked in, um, upwards of of fifty thousand dollars. Now, to put that in perspective, when somebody pays for their little like all-inclusive vacation you're like oh I got a great deal I spent 600 bucks I'm going for a week away yeah you're getting off the plane you're not loaded you're not flash and cheese everywhere but what you are doing is they know you're a Canadian and that passport is worth 10 to 50 thousand dollars is it worth them mugging you for that passport to sell it even at half that sure it is so do you want to come across as a Canadian uh, or an American, or a Brit, or a Swede, or a Dane, or whatever. No, ideally, you just want to be someone returning home local. Okay, your passport is something that's often overlooked as as a valuable, and um, they are often targeted depending on where you're coming from for their rate of value. Uh, Japanese uh, nationals are targeted. Their passport's very strong, allows them uh, non-visa travel to very many countries. And uh, their passport, they're, they're victimized kind of uh, systemically almost because of that. Um, lock picks and bypass tools. So this is something I carry. If you're not skilled in it and you don't know uh, how to use them, probably not a good idea. But me personally, every time I travel, uh, I travel with uh, a set of entry tools. Uh, they're they're going to be more subtle uh, when I travel with them. But... Uh, I travel with entry tools and I travel with escape tools. It's just my personal stuff, my uh, my skill sets. And um, uh, to this point, I mean, I've traveled internationally uh, all over with them uh, and I've had not had any issues with them. Uh, where they've become a problem is when people um, keep them in their pockets and then they go through a metal detector and then, they're you know, it's like empty out your pockets. Uh, just take all your stuff off put it in there with your change and your wires and stuff like that from your um, from your laptop and your phone and all that mishmash it up and throw it in uh, into the scanner. Don't walk through the metal detector with them because they're going to be asking you to take it off. Okay. Just take everything off, put it through the scanner. Nobody cares because it's not a bomb and it's not a knife. So as long as it's not a weapon, there are no um, generally in Canada and the States, there are no um, travel restrictions on it. However, like I said at the very beginning, make sure you check what the laws are of where you're going. So if lockpicks, for instance, are completely illegal in the country you're going to, you have to make the determination if that's worth the risk or not. Okay. Moving on, electronics control. So um, if you're going to like Airbnbs or you have a higher threat level uh, for yourself, you might want to look into getting... Um, one of the scanners so they um it's got like a little lens in it you can kind of walk it around your room and if there are any pinhole cameras it'll start to reflect off of it through a, a specific filter uh, and you can find hidden cameras um same thing goes with the radio frequency scanner so you can do like a bug sweep through your room to see if there's any kinds of microphones or anything recording devices um uh, I, I dare say that a lot of the Eastern Bloc countries still have a lot of listening devices left over from uh, um, before the Iron Curtain, but these are all things that you have to kind of figure out what is uh, what your personal threshold for, for that is. Travel insurance. Uh, aside from the regular kind of travel insurance, like cancellation and stuff, you, depending on where you're going and what you're going for and what your appetite for risk is, there are other companies that will do extra travel insurance. They also have specialized um, kind of waivers that you can get or riders or, uh, that you can get. Um, one company, will, if you have a medical emergency, will actually send a team to exfiltrate you and extract you from that region and take you to an actual like hospital of like repute, you know, and actually take you there 
and get you the medical attention that you need. They will fly you out on a private jet and all kinds of stuff. And now, sure, you're paying for that. Um, but there are same kind of thing happens if you're kidnapped, you can buy that kind of insurance. Uh, and uh, you're uh, there are people that will come in and either negotiate uh, your release or try and have you um, rescued. So there's there's all kinds of different types of travel insurance, but it, it, they all come down to what is the best thing for you and what is your appetite for risk. Uh, switching gears, garbage and Ziploc bags, they always come in handy. Um, uh, you'd be surprised how often it's like, oh crap, I, I just, I got a couple of things here, a couple of things there, I need a bag. Or, oh, my bag split and I need to carry this. Or, oh, my clothes are, are wet or dirty. I need I need a bag to put them in. So a couple of black garbage bags and a couple of like Ziploc freezer bags go a long way. Adapters, depending on where you are in the world, the plugs might be different. Have the appropriate adapters for where you're going. It will save you all kinds of headache. Also, do not think that when you get to where you're going, that you're going to be able to find the adapters you need um, immediately. Uh, if you show up at an airport at a, whatever, a weird time, the shops may not be open. Uh, so sure, you can see what you need, but it's on the other side of the glass there and they don't open for another four hours. So get your stuff beforehand. Uh, mini multi tool. So if you, there's like these little keychain like Gerber and Leatherman multi tools, uh, generally those are acceptable to fly with. However, make sure that you get the model without the blade on it. Uh, so because uh, they'll take them away if there's a knife on it generally, but there are versions. I, I know Gerber makes one. It does not have a knife. It's got all the other tools, but it doesn't have a knife and therefore it's safe to fly. Uh, and then hard copy back. Uh, backups of your documents. So as we were saying before, protect your electronics and your documents, uh, protect your information, beware elicitation, somebody who's too interested in you. So if I'm sitting on a, in, in a plane and somebody sits beside me and really just starts asking me a lot of questions about myself, I'm not that interesting. Um, and I'm not that good looking. So generally speaking, it's, you know, I mean, I'm good looking, but I mean, I'm not that good looking, right? That So um, it you got to be aware of why, why is someone so interested in you as a stranger? And, um, uh, you know, be aware of what kind of information you're uh, giving away and how they may be weaponized against you or your company. Uh, or the organization you're with. A lot of times it's not you that they're going after, it's what you know that they can then leverage to the next step, to the next step, to the next step, to get to the, whatever their ultimate goal is. So um, keep that in mind. Um, understand your value in another country. Um, so again, you get off a plane in a, in a not so rich country and uh, you know your passport, worth a lot of money. If you're there with a, uh, with a, you know, a uh, significant other, uh, that's two of you. If you're there with a family, that's four of you. Okay. And now that, that value has increased a lot and, um, you know, showing up and flashing a gun and saying, give me your four passports seems to be pretty good risk versus reward. Right. So advertising that fact is probably something you don't want to do perceived wealth. So if you're flashing everything, you're taking a lot of selfies, you're wearing like flashy, like jewelry, even if it's costume jewelry, but you're putting on airs uh, that you're going to attract attention and probably not the attention that you're looking for. Um, so, and also your status. And by that, I mean, if you work for a big mining company and you're in South America and there's a big, you know, or a hydro hydroelectric company or a building company, and they're building a dam, right? Well, the locals don't necessarily like that. So you're you're nothing and nobody, but you belong to this company and they know the company is going to pay a ransom when they hit, kidnap you and say, we're going to kill them or you give us a million dollars. So um, understand that you as an individual may not be worth all that um, in the grand scheme of things, but you are a representative of something larger that is of value to that group. So it's something to consider. So again, keeping a lower profile is probably the better way to go. Um, when you're in your room, 
uh, be sure to keep your information uh, clear and private. Um, don't just leave stuff out like files and folders and stuff like that. Um, and um, also when you get there, uh, I should say when you walk into your room, don't just dismiss. If someone's going to walk you up to your room, don't just dismiss them. Have them walk into the room first. Uh, leave the door open. Check your room. Check in the room, uh, in bathroom and behind the closet and stuff like that, or the curtains. Make sure the room is empty. Have a look. Make a show of it that you're checking to make make sure the room is just the way you want it, and then you can give them their their tip, and they can leave once everything's okay. Okay. Um, when you get to your hotel, uh, no one understand your exit options. So have an idea of where the hotel is, how it's situated, where, you know, is the main, the main street is on the West side. Uh, there's exit there, but on the other side, are you overlooking a river? Is it, you know, is it a cliff? Is it just another street? Uh, how can you get out? Uh, so if there's a fire, or something like that, what are your options? Where's your room in relation to the fire escapes? Uh, this is important because it can happen and uh, and you don't just want to be sitting there going, oh, I don't, I don't know, I'm going to follow everybody else. Well, everybody else might be wrong. Figure it out for yourself. Uh, carry a locking option. So like I mentioned, the door wedge, I carry two. I got mine at the dollar store. They're they're good rubber door wedges. I don't, I don't really like the hard plastic kind because depending on if it's a tile floor, it's just going to slide off. So uh, I like the... Uh, the rubber ones or uh, another product is called uh, the uh, wedge it or whatever. And it's like a folding, um, folding one, but there's a bunch of different stuff, things on the market. You can look into them. Um, check your possible points of entry. So like I said, I carry two wedges because my main door, and then there's the adjoining door that I, uh, you know, there's another room there. There's another group of people in there. Uh, I don't trust that. So a lot of times I'll, I'll throw a wedge there because I want to delay any kind of entry uh, long enough for me to prepare myself to meet it. Um, balconies, balconies are big. So depending on the way it's set up, uh, somebody might be able to like swing around from one balcony to another or from top to bottom. So you might wanna look at, you know, go out to your balcony, take a look. You know, can someone, is, can someone reasonably make it? Um, forget about being afraid of it, but can somebody, reasonably do that and if the answer is yes then it's a possible point of entry uh so you're going to want to close that and keep it locked all the time okay uh keep a small flashlight handy so caribbean a lot of times power failures are a thing right they just they happen um keep a flashlight with you power goes out in the middle of the night uh you want to be able to to make your way around uh you know, if it's if it's a storm or something like that, you want to be able to to get around and see what's happening. OK, it's going to aid in your mobility. Do not use your phone or rely on your phone as a flashlight. OK, your phone was not designed to be a flashlight. It's just a nice to have little addition. OK, get yourself a small, ideally waterproof one battery like double A or triple A flashlight. And that's what you use. Your phone is for communication primarily okay and that's what it should be i know we all like to use the various gizmos in our phones but generally if you're in a bad situation you're going to want as much juice in your phone to make communication with parties that you need to make to call for help then the flashlight is chewing up that communication time okay so prioritize what's important and for your phone it's communication for light it should be a separate flashlight. Also, if you drop your phone, you've lost your flashlight. So don't do don't don't rely on your phone for that. Get yourself like twelve twelve dollar flashlight or eight dollar flashlight from Canadian Tire or uh, a headlamp, and um, and have that. Okay. Um, don't open your door unless you're expecting someone and they can verify who they are. So uh, you know, did you order room service? The answer is yes. You can go to the door and be like, oh, you know, who is it? Uh, I can't see you through the peephole. And if you can't see them, if they can't step back and they're clearly in, you know, the outfit of the hotel, um, be like, I, I think, you, um, you know, you can just leave it outside the door and I'll get it in a few minutes and you can watch them leave, get your stuff, etc. 
Um, if it does, if it feels off, it probably is. And even if it's not, who cares? Your safety is more important than feeling awkward. Okay. Don't trust the hotel safe. Okay. Do not trust the hotel safe. My good friend, lock picking lawyer, uh, illustrates this so well. Uh, I, and I'll tell you a story after. Oh, hold on. Where'd it go? Next slide. So uh, I'm going to take a minute and a half or so, and uh, we're going to watch this quick little video, but it's informative. Trust me. This is the lock picking lawyer, and what I have for you today is a public service announcement on safe lock hotel saves. I'm actually in a hotel right now with one of these safes, and I'm about to lock up some true valuables. Got a bottle of Lagavulin 16 year old scotch whiskey. So let's put a code in and lock it up. And as you can see, this is actually locked. Let's try putting the incorrect code in. And you can see it will not open. However, what this hotel did not do is reset the administrator password that comes from the factory. So if we enter the super user mode and press in the factory code of 9999999, this hotel safe will open right up. So if you're ever in a hotel that has one of these safe lock products and you need to use it to lock up some of your valuables, it might be a good idea to make sure that the hotel has reset the administrator password before relying on it to protect your goods. That's all I have for you today. If you do have any questions or comments about this, please put them below. If you like this video and would like to see more like it, please subscribe. And as always, have a nice day. Thank you. Such a wonderful human being. He's he's such a great guy and his, his level of knowledge is scary. Uh, but he makes a really good point. I actually do this with every hotel that I go to. So when I get to a hotel and there's a hotel safe, I will do something. Uh, like this, I will look at the brand. So this is safe lock, but whatever, they're, they're always going to have a brand on them. And I'll Google it. Uh, administrator password or factory reset code or something like that. And um, you'll generally get a document uh, that will speak to how to either reset it or what the, the factory uh, preset code was. And I will try exactly this. And probably eight out of 10 times, the factory code will not have been removed. So uh, in that case, I know that I cannot really trust that safe. I don't trust any of the safes anyways for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the override or administrator password that may have been set up by the hotel is generally going to be found out by a lot of the hotel staff. Whenever a customer, um, one of their guests locks something in the in the safe and they can't remember what the combo was, somebody's going to get set up, sent up to the room, punch in the administrator password, and open up the safe for them. And it's never just going to be the manager. It's going to be one of a lot of other people. The staff talk, and eventually they're all going to know it. So that's cleaning staff. Uh, uh, maintenance staff, everybody. So you can't rely on it to be foolproof. The other thing is, is that oftentimes safes like this, uh, where like the name of it is, uh, safe lock, let's say, there'll be like a little plate, uh, two screws, something like that. And what happens is you can actually, uh, or sometimes a little sliding door, and under the plate or under the sliding door is going to be a key bypass. Nine times out of 10, uh, that lock is a joke and I can open it with my low profile lock to, uh, lock picking tools very quickly and gain access to, um, to the safe without going through the electronics at all. So these are all things to keep in mind. If you have something really, really sensitive, uh, don't use the safe either go to the hotel manager if it's in a reputable hotel and ask them to put it in the uh in the hotel safe uh the manager safe uh and they will do that if it's if it's something important 
if that's if you're in a seedy hotel or you're in a place that you just don't trust the integrity of the hotel or the establishment, uh, you can start looking at different places to hide your stuff. And that's a whole other thing, but um, uh, a small like little screwdriver set or something like that can go a long way in being able to, you know, open the back of a, uh, like an alarm clock and putting something in or the wall plates or um, all kinds of stuff. Ziploc bag in the, uh, in the tank of your toilet. Uh, th there's, a, there's a ton of different things that you can start to do to keep something really valuable uh, away from a, a cursory exam or search by, um, uh, by a, a cleaner or someone that's on the take, okay? Right, so when we're looking at um, active risk management, we wanna, when th things are starting to happen, Okay, things are starting to go sideways. We want to start taking in as much of that information as possible. Uh, being aware is going to be a huge part of that, but go with your gut. If something's feeling off, go with your gut. Move with purpose. Okay, so identify the next place you want to go to. So if there's some kind of civil unrest and the streets are crazy, you identify there's an alley across the street. I'm going for that alley. Okay, um, because where I am is the position is deteriorating. So evaluate your positioning and how to get to that point, maybe behind a car or whatever, uh, as you go and off you go. Uh, look for avenues of exit and safety. So when you're walking around town, think to yourself, if something happens here, you know, where can I take cover? If someone starts shooting. Oh, there's, there's concrete planters over there. I can jump behind that or, um, or what have you, right? Movement is going to be life. Standing still is not a good way to go. Get moving, get to a better position, okay? Um, Ed Calderon from um, Ed's Manifesto puts it really, really succinctly. Uh, stillness is death. If you just stand there, uh, you're inviting problems. So uh, by moving, you can continuously uh, aim to increase your, uh, your positioning and uh, better it. So some of the things that I do um, to uh, to carry with me, um, I swap out my shoelaces um, when I travel. Well, in general, in life, uh, I, I take out my shoelaces and I swap them out for either paracord or Technora. Generally, uh, paracord. The upside to it is that it comes in any color, so you can order. Uh, you know, if you want pink laces or if you want you know, camo laces or something like that, you can, you can order them and you can now have paracord laces. And the great thing about it is that it gives you two lengths of, you know, six feet each, let's say, uh, and it's 550 cord. It can be used for all kinds of stuff in an emergency, not the least of which is, is a friction saw to cut out, cut yourself out of restraints. Uh, always carry a pen. My, my, my personal favorite is, is a metal pen. Uh, but uh, if I have to, uh, I'll take a Bic. The cool thing about a Bic pen is that you can take it and actually file it down on a, on a carpet, like polyester carpet, especially the kind of stuff that you see in airports uh, or hotels, um, that cheap industrial stuff. And the friction will actually melt down the side of the pen and you'll be able to have like a, a bit of an angle on it. And uh, that'll aid in, uh, in uh, penetration of a, of a human soft spot. Um, Hair clips. Uh, so when I teach counter custody, uh, one of the we can make escape tools out of the hair clips, um, and I, I can show people how to do that. But I carry a couple of them on me uh, in various places so that I can access them even if I am restrained. Uh, blades and tools. And the thing is, is that generally you can't fly with blades, but it doesn't have to be fancy. Your you know four hundred dollar you know combat folder and stuff like that you're not going to be traveling with it so because you can't really carry that stuff generally with you anyways i tend to not invest a lot of money in my the blades that i carry i mean sure i like knives don't get me wrong but um my daily carry is just like a what is it the uh it's, it's, it's called the squid it was like 30 bucks or something like that right 
uh, it does what I need it to. It's a sharp edge. The thing is, when I travel, I still don't get to carry it. So what I tend to do is when I get on ground somewhere, I'll walk into a local convenience store or a hardware store or a general store, and I'll pick up some kind of blade, something that I can open a packaged lunch or, or, or a wrapper of some sort. It's not for combat or protecting yourself, but you want to have a blade to do stuff. Uh, and also, it just comes in handy a million times a day. Uh, various tools. Uh, so again, escape tools, um, handcuff keys. Uh, if 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 that's something that you're concerned with, I would research the types of restraints used in that particular part of the world, and to see if the standard American kind of uh, Smith and Wesson handcuff key is applicable to that. Sometimes it will be, sometimes it won't be. If it's not, get a different handcuff key. Uh, the advanced handcuff key that we sell and carry um, will open over 50 different varieties. So the one I carry on my uh, uh, GTFO bracelet, which is a, an escape bracelet, it's got a, a ceramic uh, composite bead on it that'll break glass uh, on a shock cord, but it also has a uh, uh, handcuff key that will get you out of a lot of different restraints. Um, I also carry this escape kit. Uh, it's got a bunch of different tools. It's called the uh, Advanced Personal Escape Kit. Uh, it's made out of Technora. has a breakaway connector with another breaker beam inside, handcuff shim, handcuff key, and a, a glow stick. And uh, the Technora friction saw will cut through uh, any non-metallic restraints, but also uh, uh, one of the added benefits is uh, self-rescue from, let's say, uh, a car crash or something like that. Uh, the Technora will cut through a seatbelt uh, so it can get you out or you can aid in getting someone else out. So these are some of the tools that I'll carry. Uh, other tools, a lighter, a flashlight, my GTFO bracelet, um, and uh, that sort of stuff. Just uh, uh, I've got a little clip wallet as well. I'll carry some basics like some band-aids and stuff like that. When you walk a lot, when you travel, you might get a blister. Simple stuff like that, not crazy. Uh, but ultimately, the most important thing that you're carrying with you is your mindset. Um, being switched on and being armed is a mindset. It doesn't matter uh, the gear that you have per se. It's how are you adapting to your environment and how are you uh, interfacing with it and allowing it to interface with you. Okay. So some improvised defensive tools will in include keys. I'm not too fond of them, but, um, as a distraction device, you know, tossing a set of keys in someone's eyes as you bolt the other way might buy you a bit of time and is a good distraction, uh, pens and pencils. So again, pens for me, pencils for John Wick. Uh, bike lock and chain. Uh, if you're in a country where bikes are a big thing, carrying a bike lock and a and a chain is uh, is a pretty significant weapon uh, to hit somebody with, and uh, it's an everyday item, right? So it uh, it's easy enough to uh, to escape notice. Uh, tools of various kinds, so hammer, screwdrivers, uh, you know that sort of stuff. Um, hammers and screwdrivers can do a hell of a lot of damage. Um, so, you know, available readily everywhere, easy to get, um, pepper spray or dog spray, eh, not a fan, but, uh, depending on what your situation is, it might be worth it. Usually they're illegal, but, um, Hey, if you can stop somebody in the face with it, they are effective. Uh, if you can plant it, just be aware of cross contamination. So zapping somebody and you're in an enclosed space, like an elevator, you're both going to take it uh, or you're like pissing in the wind, you spray it and it comes back on you. Now you have to deal with it as well. Uh, so it's something to just be aware of. Um, one thing I like is a hot coffee or tea. If you've ever been to a Tim Hortons and you've ordered a tea, um, you know, you're carrying about 8 million degrees Kelvin in your hand and you can't drink that till like three days later. So I don't know about you, but if someone comes at you and you throw that in their face, uh, they'll they'll melt and it'll like cut through them like a you know like a lightsaber or something like that, and they're toast. So understand that it's not a traditional weapon, but damn, would that be painful? Um, so 
you have that option, something that you can go everywhere with. Nobody's going to ask you about that. But if someone comes at you and, you know, pulls something on you and says, give me your, you know, you're, you're going to go in this back alley and I'm going to do some nasty stuff to you. Well, maybe, you know, your thumb might take that lid off a little bit and introduce them to, to the tea or the coffee that you just got. So start thinking outside the box like that. Uh, a water bottle or a beer bottle, a mug or a tumbler. If you have those like stainless steel water bottles or like a stainless steel, like, you know, coffee tumbler in the morning, it's steel. Whacking someone in the head with that is going to produce a lot more. Um, it's a force multiplier. It'll, it'll hurt a lot more than hitting them with your hand. So, and you can repeatedly keep hitting them and you're not going to hurt yourself. So it's another option. You can walk around all day with a metal water bottle. Nobody's going to ask you anything about it, but if someone puts their hands on you, you've got a good you know, a good option there. Uh, magazines, book, newspapers, a vase, if it's in your hotel room, right? Anything that can be used to increase the distance and increase striking power. Uh, personally, I like things that are really out there, like the walls and floors, the earth, for instance, and taking someone and bouncing their head off of it, a telephone pole, for instance, um, things like that, that are going to be harder, a car door, for instance, that stuff is harder than the person. So being able to use your environment to your advantage is a really big thing. And all you're looking for is a window to create a gap so that you can get out of there. Okay. Uh, animals like that one. Um, you could throw an animal at someone. Um, literally, if you've ever seen a, what happens to a cat, if a cat's thrown at someone, um, the person on the receiving end, it's not a good thing. But also, if you happen to have a dog with you or something like that, uh, it becomes an option uh, as a, if they're willing to protect you, if the animal is willing to protect you. Okay. Um, so jewelry, you know, rings and stuff like that, if they've got stones in them or whatever, heavy, uh, heavy jewelry, uh, shoes, uh, the ladies with the heels, like take one of those off and hit somebody with it. It's, it, it's going to be a lot, uh, a lot for that person to think about. So uh, anything that's harder than your hand, really, uh, and just use your imagination. Um, so primary targets for kidnapping and hostage takers. Generally, if you're in the military or paramilitary organization, uh, you work for government or humanitarian worker, um, you're going to be kind of primo for as a target for um, for kidnapping for ransom. Um, employees, like I was saying, of big corporations, banks too, um, foreigners, tourists. Um, usually it's for money. Um, human trafficking is part of it. Um, generally, human trafficking targets, uh, mostly women, uh, but there's all kinds. Um, but generally it's for money. Uh, people with enemies. So if you're part of a family that you know you know, has problems with, with other families and stuff like that. Uh, you're probably going to know about that sort of thing, who your enemies are, but if you're going onto their turf, something to think about. Okay. But ultimately anybody can be a target of uh, a kidnapping, a hostage taking. Um, it, it can be a crime of opportunity. You're in a mall and, and somebody takes the mall hostage or, or the hotel or something like that. And you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Okay. And, uh, uh, you know, you don't want to stand out. Uh, uh, you don't want to stand out, ideally. So when, we, when we're traveling around, we want to make friends with the locals um, if we can, okay? Being nice to people is a real easy thing, showing respect. And like I mentioned before, having a few words of the local language will go a long way, tipping well, um, and being gracious and humble will go a long way in building rapport uh, with the locals, okay? Uh, you don't have to be obsequious and kiss their ass and, and all kinds of stuff, but the, just basic basic decency and respect and not thinking that you're better than them just because you're from a different country. Um, so you can start making friends with those locals, just decency. Um, buy your extras locally. So, um, I use the example of toothpaste in the tourist area that says Crest or whatever, or Colgate, six bucks for a tube, but you go to the local one and it's the local version of it, and that's 50 cents. 
go buy the 50 cent one. Uh, you're pretty much going to be getting the same product uh, or the local version of it. It'll cost you less, but it'll also put you better in with the locals when they see you contributing to their economy like a local and you're using their products. Uh, dress modestly and be, be respectful. Okay. Um, if you're trying to make a spectacle of yourself, you're going to get attention. It's just that simple. Okay. Use common sense, uh, but do enjoy the culture that you're in. Okay. You're traveling to enjoy a new place and a new, uh, a new group of people and a new way of living. Um, you enjoy it. Just be aware while you're doing it. And that doesn't mean you have to be paranoid. Just understand what's going on, understand the risks and understand that, um, you know, if if you're oblivious to what's going on, you're at the mercy of the people that want to do something to you, okay? But if you're switched on, more often than not, you're going to be able to head something off before it happens to you, okay? Um, now, when... Um, one thing that before we get home, actually... Um, or even when we're traveling, one thing you might want to consider, and this has been a thing uh, now kind of at the end of uh, the COVID um, situation with all the travel delays that were uh, like over Christmas, you might want to consider putting a GPS tracker or uh, an, uh, an air tag into your checked luggage if you're checking your luggage, okay? If you have to check it, you might consider dropping a few bucks and putting a tracker in it. Um, it's it's going to help you identify where your stuff is. Uh, generally speaking, uh, Air Canada was absolutely horrible over the holidays. Uh, they they had so many problems and so many bags were lost. Some some people's bags it's like oh I, I travel from Ottawa to Toronto, but somehow my bag ended up in in Memphis. Like what the hell is it doing there, and how did it get there? And, and Air Canada would say, well I, we didn't we have no idea where your bag is. And the traveler's like, well, my bag shows like it's sitting in Memphis right now. So why don't you go get it? And the people who had a lot of the air tags were able to uh, direct their airlines to go get them. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I know there's a bit of a class action that's building right now because a lot of the bags that were delayed that the airline just gave up on and donated them, um, uh, like donated them, like just gave them up. And these were people's bags and they know what happened uh, because they had air tags in them and they were uh, and GPS trackers and they were able to track their bags as to where they went. So something to consider. Uh, if you're looking for a GPS tracker, uh, you can check out uh, on Instagram and on uh, Google uh, Tiny Transmitters. Uh, it's a Canadian veteran owned company uh, and he custom makes um, by hand uh, some really great uh, electronics gear. And, uh, I'm just waiting for my GPS tracker actually to come in. Um, that's built being, uh, built to spec. So, uh, you can give them, a, uh, give them a look, but, uh, when you're home, uh, I, I'd suggest to you that, you know, take stock of everything that went well and what didn't, um, there's going to be ups and downs in every vacation. Uh, even even my best vacations that I've ever gone on and my best trips have always had challenges. And oftentimes those challenges could have been in, like much, much, much worse had I not been on the ball or done previous uh, trip planning or anything like that. So uh, being able to kind of do an after action report and say what what went well and what didn't uh, will help you better plan for the next time, okay? Uh, when you get home, uh, the people that you left information with, your itinerary, your trusted people back home, uh, you got to let them know you're home and that you're safe. So otherwise, they're going to look at your itinerary. They're going to be like, hey, they were supposed to be here yesterday, and I haven't heard anything from them. So do I call the cops? Like, you know, and there's, you know, what kind of prearranged... Uh, protocols did you have in place and if you fail to check in they're going to assume that something's wrong so let those people know uh you know they're looking out for you while you're away uh close that loop let them know you're home and uh and thank them for it hopefully you bought them a souvenir and um 
you know, and, and that's, that's something you don't have to worry about. Check on the integrity of your home. So uh, one of the areas that I talk about when I deliver training, we do uh, covert entry. So lock picking, lock bypassing, physical security. Um, check the integrity of your home when you're back. Was someone looking after it or did you just lock it up and take off and come back? Is it the way you left it? Is there anything wrong? Um, you know, if the person that was looking after it, you know, feeding your cat, watering your plants, you know, flushing your fish down the toilet, did they uh, have anything happen? Is there any mail that's important? Is there, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, try and get a feel for what's happened while you've been away and is everything okay? Okay. Um, Another thing, keep an eye when you get back over the next several weeks to even a couple of months on your bank statements. So if you were using your credit card while you were traveling, which generally you probably were, or even taking money, cash money out at an ATM abroad, you want to do a quick audit and a quick check of the stuff, the, the payments that are being made or the charges that are coming in uh, during that time period. If you're starting to get charges after you left, you know something's wrong, right? Um, and some of those will be delayed and they'll be legitimate, but you wanna make sure that you're keeping on track and making sure that nobody's skimmed your card while you've been away or uh, they took your number at a hotel and they've you know, they're, they've gone on a shopping spree or whatever. Uh, it's happened before. Um, I've had one or two instances like that and uh, immediately when I found it, called up the credit card company, explained I haven't been there in two weeks and there's no way that that I'm still making payment or making purchases. And, you know, charges reversed everything. They killed my card and got me a new one. So, uh, but it is something you want to uh, keep in mind. Um, and um, I guess when you, when you get back, you want to unpack, um, unpack and launder everything, depending on where you are in the world. You might be bringing back pests of various kinds, so bugs of various kinds, uh, spores and stuff like that, like uh, plant matter. Uh, these things can be very bad for you, but they can also be bad for your home. So imagine coming back with a cockroach that is like this big, and suddenly it finds a whole, uh, you know, a new home in your in your place. Um, these are all things that you can kind of nip in the bud as soon as you get back. Go unpack everything, launder everything immediately, um, and, uh, and and clean, okay? Clean yourself, clean your stuff. It seems like common sense, but you'd be surprised how many people just drop their bag when they're home and don't touch it for like a week, and it just kind of sits there. So clean, sanitize everything. Take the tags off your luggage, rip it up, get rid of it. If you don't need receipts anymore because you've lawfully declared it to customs as you've been coming home, get rid of those receipts. Um, if you don't need them anymore, just get rid of everything, sanitize everything. And, um, and then from there, just enjoy the memories. And then you can start posting to the gram after you come back and you're safely at home and people still think you're on vacation. And it's great because nobody can rob your house while you're still sitting. Well, they can if you're sitting in it, but I mean, you have a bit more control over the situation, right? So um, it's important to have, have that control, okay? Um, so kind of as uh, final points, uh, when it comes to, to your personal safety, your personal security, um, it's one thing that I uh, really take heart in and um, kind of identify with. And uh, it's, this, it's this scene from the movie Spy Game and uh, it's Robert Redford talking to uh, Brad Pitt uh, about kind of being being a spy, right? But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a bit of a philosophy that it, that he mentions, and it's something that I uh, really incorporate into into the teaching that I do. So I'm going to play it, and uh, and then I'll just have a final word or two. Oh. Oh. What is this on you? Obviously, yeah. Yeah, my best friend. I thought spies drank martinis. Scotch, never less than 12 years old. Is that right? Agency rules? My rules. I said, what else? What else do I need to know? Put away some money so you can die someplace warm. 
Don't ever touch it. Not for anyone ever. Okay. Is that it? Don't ever risk your life or your career for an asset. Comes down to you or them, send flowers. If it comes down to you or them, send flowers. It's a pretty good uh, philosophy in, in a lot of ways, not just in um, in uh, dealing with violence, but in, in life in general, if, uh, from, a, from a competitive challenge, you know, if uh, something challenges your life, it comes down to you or it, uh, best to carry on and uh, send flowers uh, rather than it having, uh, having got the best of you. So um, it's, a, uh, it's a good point that I like to, to push on. And um, I, I find it, it bears on, on personal safety and security, especially when one is abroad. So um, with that, I'm going to say thank you. That's, uh, that's it for tonight. So I think, uh, wow, I went, uh, went pretty long with that. But uh, um, I want to say thank you to everybody uh, for that. And uh, I see Jeff is taken back. So you got control, my man, and uh, hey, uh, yeah, you can do some Q and A uh, if, you, if you want. I'm I'm good. Yeah, yeah. Well, what I'll say is, uh, man, you must be a blast in Cancun, Boris. I could just see <laughs> us down there getting into fights, throwing chickens at people. <laughs> um, no, I can't. Especially with the hooks they got on the back of those chicken legs. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially some of the roosters. Um, Guys, just I want to drive home one point. Uh, Boris did touch on it lots, but that's situational awareness, keeping your mental faculties. And he touched on uh, Maslow's law early on. Usually when we travel, we fly. Flying's tiring, no matter who you are, Jason Bourne, Jeff Depotti, or Boris. It's tiring. It's taxing on your system. So already you're not sleeping, probably are hungry. You're already bringing yourself into deficiency. So Boris gave all these tools that really actually, when you do them, don't take all that long once they're set up it, it, to, you know, some reckies, a bit of kits that you have, a bit of a go bag slash carry on um, that you can repeat in order to enjoy the areas more. And that gives you the ability to get into spicier areas um, that are a little bit more challenging to travel to. That way there you have more tools, you have more faculties to stay with it. Uh, Boris, uh, I'm just gonna thank you, buddy. I appreciate you coming on on sharing this we will post post it to the mighty networks guys um, for those of you who couldn't uh, stay with us the whole time um, or to revisit some of the info process guys uh you'll you'll probably see some of this again and um yeah that's about it for me uh anyone wants uh further training info from boris uh, true north tradecraft um, he does uh restraint defeat and other stuff um uh, uh, that you can find there. He's on Instagram and so on. So anyways, Boris, uh, without further ado, namaste. Uh, guys, uh, thanks for joining us and we'll talk to you later, okay? Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jeff. Stay See safe Boris. out there, guys. Cheers.